loaded, so well, it's good to see everybody here tonight. I know the rain is a little bit uh, daunting, at least a few times out there. I sat in the truck for about 20 minutes waiting for it to ease up just a little bit. But we're glad that you're here this evening as we continue our study in the uh, Bible dealing with restoration of the uh, examples of restoration in God's Word. And as we've done each night this week, we uh, I've looked at a song that if I were picking a theme song for the lesson, uh, I believe I would use, uh, you know, and lead. Uh, we've not done that, as I've decided that it probably would be just as beneficial to read the, the words. And of course, we've looked at Blessed Assurance, which again is runs throughout the entire week, the great physician. Uh, and, uh, but tonight I want to do something a little different because, and I told Chris last night, I uh, wanted to, between, he, he said there was a budget for VBS, you know, he went in, in the letter, he sent the information he sent, and I didn't use any of my budget, now did I, Chris? Okay. Hey, there you go. Well, I was going to go over the line by requesting all new songbooks for the auditorium. <laughs> Because there is in the song books that uh, praise for the Lord that we use at uh, the congregation in Beelington, uh, a song that uh, when we look at the restoration in the spiritual sense um, uh, is just phenomenal. The words, the meaning of those words uh, are astounding. Now there's a couple songs in this song book and as well as the praise for the Lord song book that are quite good as well. Uh, one that I thought about here would be, uh, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall me be made white as wool. But this song that uh, I want to read the, the words to is a song by the title of Lord Jesus, I Long to Be Perfectly Whole. And I have, in all honesty, a difficult time reading the words without wanting to sing the song because it's a beautiful uh, melody, it, it's, you know, once you get it in your head, it's one of those songs that just are very difficult to get unstuck. But the words of this song, and it tells the story of our conversion from our sinful life through to the time when we can be made white as snow. And as we look at uh, the conversion of the Apostle Paul, or Saul as he was called prior to uh, his beginning, his ministry. Uh, we know, of course, he went through that conversion process. And so I'd like to read, there are four verses to this song, uh, and I would like to read, so kind of listen carefully. I know you can't look at the, read the, the words in the song book because it's just not in this book. But here is the, the, the phrases of this song. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The chorus then says, whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, let nothing unholy remain. Apply thine own blood and extract every stain. To get this blessed cleansing, I all things forego. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Oh, we found, oh it's in the, uh, all right, it's in the, uh, the, the digital songbook. So, uh, yeah, so the verse, uh, let's see if it's, I'm lost now. They got, got me, uh, all of a sudden the words appeared up here, and I'm thinking, oh, wow. <laughs> Threw me off track there for a second. Uh, verse 3, Lord Jesus, look down from thy throne in the skies and help me to make a complete sacrifice. I give up myself and whatever I know. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord, fourth verse, for, Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing I see thy blood flow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, thou seest, I patiently wait. 
Come now and within me a new life create. To those who have sought thee, thou never say no. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The blessings, by, the blessing, blessings by faith I receive from above, O oh glory, my soul is made perfect in love. My prayer has prevailed, and this moment I know the blood is applied. I am whiter than snow. And so those words, I think, are really very important, and I want to get rid of this phone. I don't like to have my phone with me. It'd be my luck to go off, but I've got it all muted up, but we were, and we'd make a I knew that thing back there. Uh, we make a conscious effort during, at the congregation in Beelington to try to encourage folks to turn their volumes down or put it on mute. And one night we were in service to just tell you a little story about phones. And most of us did have our phones on mute and turned down. And all of a sudden, there were about seven phones went off simultaneously. You know, now that's a little freaky when they all go off simultaneously. You know, one ringing or something like that might not be so hard to imagine. But imagine all, you know, seven or eight of them just at the same time. And here it turned out to be a, a nationwide alert. Well, I think it was a regional alert for our area. And, and as I started after the services, we all were embarrassed. You know, two of the elders' phones went off and... And, uh, you know, just, to, you know, because we try to set an example by not having our phones on it. But uh, I, afterwards, I started looking, and there are, you can go into and turn off the national alert, uh, you know, signals. But there's one that you cannot turn off, and that's a nationwide alert. And if the president or if whoever's in charge of that system sends out that alert, it will, unless your phone is completely turned off. That's the only way to stop it. And so uh, cell phones and me, kind of, I worry about them once in a while. Um, you know, and a lot of times I leave mine in my car nowadays just to be, just to be safe. Well, certainly as we look at uh, this lesson tonight, I believe this is one lesson that for each one of us has a personal application. I mean, literally. We're going to study the conversion of Saul. Uh, who became the Apostle Paul, and we're going to divide his life up into three different sections because each one of us has these same three sections of our spiritual restoration that we go through from our life of sin prior to our uh, conversion, prior to our baptism, and then our new life after we have begun the Christian walk. And so as we uh, look at Saul, we'll, we'll sort of use him and then make the application at the uh, end of our time this evening uh, to, the, you know, to each one of us because when it really comes down to it, that's what is most important. That we leave this place, if you are not an individual who has been obedient to the gospel plan of salvation. You've not had your sins washed away as the, uh, as the theme song for tonight's lesson. I, uh, I, you know, Lord, we should be praying to be made perfectly whole, that our, our sins can be washed away in the blood of Christ, and that when we leave this place tonight, we're walking a new life. We're walking uh, in the light of Christ, and we are new creatures, as Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians. And, uh, and so that is uh, obviously the, the, you know, the most important thing. And I know through the week, uh, talking to some of the members here, they've said that there are visitors, folks that are from the community, and that's uh, certainly wonderful that you're here. And we encourage you to study and to know what, you know, to, number one, to make sure that what I'm teaching and what the congregation here as a whole teaches uh, is according to God's word, and this is the plan of uh, salvation that we're trying to share with you, the, the life of Christ and his teachings, uh, his ministry, and the establishment of his church. We're going to be looking mainly in the book of Acts, and so if you'd like to open your Bibles to, because I'll be reading certain sections, this, uh, this story of the conversion of Saul kind of jumps around a little bit, uh, because we have three different, well, actually, 
at least four, maybe five places in the New Testament where we see the account of the conversion of Saul. Uh, part of it, uh, we know Luke tells the descri- he describes the initial conversion of Saul, and then uh, Paul himself, uh, as he's doing a sort of a self-defense before the Jewish mob uh, in chapter 22, and then as he's standing before King Agrippa, making his defense. And then, of course, we also know in some of his epistles, uh, he relates to some of the things that dealt with his conversion, uh, dealt with his life prior to becoming a Christian. Uh, and, uh, and as I sort of introduced, uh, teased the class, uh, tonight's class last night in the close of the uh, lesson, I mentioned the idea that, you know, some people feel well, they can't come to church. They, I'll come and, and learn about God. I'll come and uh, and become, you know, religious after I've straightened my life up, after I've got all these bad things that I'm doing, all these bad habits, all these things. You know, once I get that all fixed up, once I get that all straightened out, then uh, I'll come. Because if I came now, as bad as I am, the church building would fall down. And I've had people tell me that. I'm such a bad sinner that the building would probably fall, even though they were standing in the building working on it, uh, doing some, uh, some repair work for us. And, uh, and so, you know, we can see from Saul that if there was ever a time that a building should have fallen down, it would have been when Saul became a Christian. Because as we'll, as we'll see, the first part of Saul's life is as about as unchristian, as Chris mentioned with the the young people, it's about as much anti-Christ, it's about as much anti, not anti-God. Saul was a, well, Saul was a believer. Saul was a, an adamant believer. He was fervent. He was zealous. He was, well, he was gung-ho. Let's just put it that way. He was gung-ho about God. Of course, uh, his understanding of the situation uh, from the Old Testament law to the New Testament law uh, and the law of Christ wasn't very good yet. So let's begin and, and look at the first part of Saul's life and that is his former manner of life. What was Saul like prior to his conversion? Now, in this part, if you want to disagree with me on this, this next statement, that's fine. I have no problem about that because I can't prove a lick of it. All right? I can't prove anything about Paul's age, how old he was. There are traditions, there are speculations, there are, you know, but Paul doesn't say in my 33rd year of life or in my 45th year of life or so, you know, we don't see that. But most, well, most, several authors say that Paul probably at his death, was in his 60s, maybe early 60s, 61, 62. Um, and, and, that's, and like I said, that's a good possibility. I, I don't know. Uh, but they, they say that he probably was converted uh, about the age of 29 or 30. So the first 28, 29 years of his life, um, he lived as a, as a Jew, he lived as a child of Moses. He lived as a, you know, living probably one of the best lives that the Jewish uh, people could live. And we see that he bragged about that. He was proud of it, literally. Because if there was ever anyone who could be pride of, proud of uh, living as a, uh, as a faithful Jew, it would have been Paul. He was, you know, he did everything and he did it to the very best of his ability. And of course, uh, which is another very important point, Saul had a clear conscience in this early part of his life. In his life prior to his conversion, he says later on, I did it in all good conscience. In other words, he was clear in his mind. He thought that was what God wanted him to do. And of course, we know uh, what he was doing was being a persecutor of the church. 
So let's look at the first 28, probably, possibly 30 years of Saul's life as a sinner when it comes to the the New Testament church, as it comes to the gospel of Christ, as it comes to the, the good news that Jesus came to the earth as the Son of God and taught uh, how we should live and how we should conduct ourselves and what we must do to be saved and nailed the, the old law, the law of Moses. And I don't know, I haven't seen the signs around here, but there are still signs around the central part of the state where I live, Barber County, that say, we live by the Ten Commandment laws. Well, the only problem with that, they're not valid anymore. That's like saying, well, I live by the, 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 the laws of Berkeley County back whenever, you know, in some towns you could not, you had to call ahead before you brought a, a car into town so they could tie up the horses, all right? And those laws in some cases are still on the books, all right? You have to call ahead within, before you come to town because you'll scare the horses with your automobile. Well, you know, uh, the, you know, the old law was done away with. And just like in many cases, and in most cases, old laws are rewritten uh, to be updated, and the, you know, the new one comes into effect. They change the speed limit from whatever to whatever, 45 to 65, or 65 down to 45. If you say, well, you go down the road at 65, and they've changed it down to 45, and you say, well, it was 65 last week, I can go this fast, well, the cop's not going to, he's not going to take much uh, pity on you. He's going to say the law changed. The speed limit was changed. And so now there's a new law. And so we know that Jesus came and brought his law, taught his law and his commandments. And that, of course, is what uh, everyone from the time of his death on the cross from that point on has to do in order to be pleasing to God. So we see that in Saul's early life, he was certainly... Uh, a very good Jew. In Acts chapter 22, verse 9, uh, we see that, we see that, uh, or excuse me, verse 3. Saul says, as he's uh, defending himself before the, the Jewish mob, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicily, uh, being, but brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous towards God, as you are all today. Now, he's saying that of the, as the Jews because basically there's a mob wanting to skin him alive. They're wanting to do him, uh, do him in because of his, well, they considered it uh, desertion. And the Jews considered uh, Saul a deserter to their religion because, well, he's no longer teaching. He's no longer, he's preaching against what we stand for and what we believe. And so we know that, that in his early life, he was advancing in the, the, the Jewish religion, in Judaism, and studied at the feet of one of the, the greatest of the Jewish um, teachers, that of Gamaliel. Uh, and uh, he, you know, Gamaliel is sort of the, the Harvard or the Yale or the Oxfords or something like that. He was the best of the best places where you could go and be trained according to the law of Moses. And so Saul says, you know, I trained with the very best. I'm a Jew. And there in verse three, he says, I was a zealous Jew. I was fervent in what I was doing uh, for the Lord. In chapter 26, verse 12, uh, we see that, that apparently Saul had not only authority, from the from the the chief priest and the uh, Sanhedrin, and but he may have had some office in that particular in the Jewish religious hierarchy, because in chapter twenty six verse twelve it says, "While thus uh, occupied, and I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest." Now there's some commentators that speculate that that. Um, Saul may have been financially rewarded because of his efforts that, uh, in persecuting the church, persecuting Christians. We don't know that. Saul doesn't make that point. But uh, again, we do know that you know, out of the temple treasury, the high priest, 
They, they took a salary. They took financial you know, compensation for what they were doing. And Saul, as he's traveling around, getting authority from the, the, the Sanhedrin, from the high priest, um, to go to other places, had to have financial resources. It wasn't something, you know, we don't know how much money Saul had, what his, you know, it doesn't appear that until later on that he had an occupation. And so some commentators say that he may have actually been, you know, being paid by the high priest for the persecution of Christians. Later on, we know he did what? Turn his living to pay his way. He was a tent maker, uh, possibly a leather worker, something along that lines, because tents back then were made of uh, goat skins, and, uh, and so they, uh, you know, they, some authors say that, you know, that that may have lapped over, and of course, anything with leather and tent making would have been a useful skill, uh, and Paul, of course, uh, took advantage of that. So as in his early life, it was obvious he was advancing through the Jewish religion. As I said, he was certainly zealous. If we turn over to Philippians chapter 4 uh, and read a few verses in uh, Philippians, uh, or excuse me, chapter 3, verses 4 through 9, uh, we see Paul here telling the church of Philippi, or Philippi, as we like to say it back home, uh, we have a town down the, down the road, and it, the, from what I understand, Philippi is actually how the word is supposed to be uh, said, and and again, I'm not a linguist, but uh, that's what I'm told, that it should be pronounced Philippi even in the Bible. But anyway, that's the county seat of Barber County. Uh, beginning in verse 4 of chapter 3 of the book of Philippians. Uh, though I, well, let's go up to verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also have confidence in the flesh... If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is the, in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost, lost for Christ." But indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is from, uh, through faith in Christ, the righteous, uh, which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So Paul in verse 4 and 5 says, If there's any of you here that thinks you can boast about your, your lineage, about your heritage, about your cultural standing, he said, give it up. I can top all of you. I'm, I've, got it. I've got you all beat, basically. Okay? And he runs through that list of, the Jewish requirements, circumcised on the eighth day, uh, you know, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He just wasn't a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. That's, you know, like a double whammy. He was, was you know, as good as uh, anyone. His credentials in the Jewish uh, religion were certainly uh, tremendous. And as he said uh, there, you know, he was, you know, he had zeal. He was persecuting the church because that was what he believed, as well as the Sanhedrin, as well as the chief priest and the, the, the uh, sect of the Pharisees, that's what they thought uh, God wanted them to do. And so that's what he was doing. And so, of course, he was uh, the, a, a, uh, excuse me, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Turn back to chapter 23, Acts cha uh, chapter 23. And verse 6, uh, we see that uh, Paul there says that, or Saul at this, still Saul at this point. Uh, verse 6 uh, says, uh, then, oh no, excuse me, he's, he, his name has been changed to Paul. But Paul, but when Paul perceived that uh, one part was, were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. 
And so Paul here says, my father was a Pharisee and I'm a Pharisee. You know, so he came about it honestly. His, uh, his father had trained him, had brought him up in the, uh, the sect of the Pharisees. And so when it comes to this uh, conservative group of, of course, we know that they persecuted Jesus relentlessly. They did everything they could to entrap Jesus. And I've often wondered, and we don't have a lot of information, uh, we know that Saul, Paul, was a, a, a persecutor, as he admits by his own, uh, own words, uh, of Christians. But what was Paul, what was Saul doing at the time of the trials of Jesus, the trial of Jesus? Was he in the crowd? We know that shortly after uh, the, you know, the death of Jesus, that uh, he was consenting after uh, Stephen's sermon, uh, he was consenting to his death, holding the coats. Uh, and, you know, go th get the rocks, guys. Let's, let's stone him to death. You're here, I'll hold your coats. And so we know that, that Saul was in the area of Jerusalem. Uh, you know, and I often wonder, was he, you know, was he part of that Sanhedrin that sat in trial of Jesus? Uh, the, you know, was, he, was he there in the house of uh, Caiaphas, the high priest? When Jesus was brought in, was he maybe even there at the arrest of Jesus? We just don't know, okay? Uh, there's no indication. It's, it's interesting to, you know, somebody that is this strict in the, uh, the Jewish religion, you would think that he would be right in the middle of the whole shebang. Uh, but, but he doesn't address that, and the Holy Spirit did not reveal that to us. And so, of course, we're, uh, we're just guessing. Saul, of course, was a, a persecutor of the church. Uh, look at a, uh, Acts chapter 8. I want to read just a few verses there, beginning at uh, verse 1 of chapter 8, down through verse 3. Now Saul was consenting to his death, referring to, in Acts chapter 7, the death the stoning of Stephen. Uh, at, the, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And so we see this is the first mention of the persecution by Saul of the early church. Then flip over to chapter 22, we see him describes some of this uh, persecution, beginning in verse 4, uh, after he has, uh, in his defense before the Jewish mob, uh, talked about his lineage, his, his upbringing as a Jew, and his credentials. Verse 4, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness and all the counsel of the elders from whom I have received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in change even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. And so he was, I mean, he was the leader. He was the leader. You know, let's find this group of individuals that are following this so-called Messiah, uh, this Jesus the Christ that we yelled, crucify him, crucify him, and had him put to death. You know, let's find the followers of this way, the way of, uh, the way that Jesus, uh, you know, taught his disciples about. And they were following and they were teaching. And so we see that Saul uh, very fervently persecuted Christ, the early Christians. Then in Acts uh, or chapter 26, verse 9 through 11, we see uh, Paul saying this about his persecution of the church. Uh, 20, uh, Acts chapter 26, verse uh, 9 through 11. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. He said, whatever Jesus Christ is about, I've got to do the opposite. I've got to do everything I can to end this movement, to stop this from happening, to let's nip this thing in the bud. Don't let it get spread any further. Verse 10, this, uh, this I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. 
And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and be exceedingly enraged against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. And so Paul said, you can't find anyone that was doing everything he could to stomp out Christianity. He wanted it ended. He was a Pharisee. He wanted it over. He was a, a zealous follower of the high priest and the Pharisee sect of the Jews. And he wanted it stopped. He wanted it ended just as much as they did. And of course, they thought that it was over when Jesus was nailed to the cross. They assumed that that took care of the deal. We sealed the deal whenever the, we got the Romans to nail him to a cross. And we watched him die. Um, we watched him be taken down. And because he had prophesied that he would raise in three days, they asked for what after the burial? They asked for a guard. You know, and Pilate said, you've got your guard. Make it as secure as you can. And of course, uh, we know that the tomb, he was placed in the tomb, that the stone was rolled in front. Guards were placed, and these weren't your ordinary security guards maybe at the mall, folks. These were Roman soldiers. And Roman soldiers were not known for falling asleep on the job. All right? And they weren't known for goofing off on the job, taking a, taking a, a coffee break. That's not what Roman soldiers did. Because if Roman soldiers didn't carry out their job to the letter, they died at the end of their shift. Now that's... You know, I'm not sure what workers would do today if they didn't carry out their job at the end of their shift, you know, if, you, if some of them were put to death. But that's the way the Roman guards were. And, of course, uh, the Roman guards themselves could not stop Jesus' resurrection. We'll cover that story tomorrow night, won't we, Chris? All right, so that will be tomorrow night. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, the most important event uh, towards our spiritual recovery. And so we see then that the persecution of uh, Christians by Saul, the persecution of the early church uh, was, uh, you know, central. He was doing what he thought was right. And then we see that part of his life came to an end. He was a sinner, and he admits that. He was the chief of sinners, and I could see how he might think so. He was responsible for the death of Christians, New Testament Christians. He put them to death. He was consenting to their death, helping, you know, hold the coats of the people that threw the stones at Stephen, and obviously others that he had drugged to prison and agreed to them being put to death while in prison. But for a period of at least three days, we see Saul changing. All right? It's interesting. He's still lost. But he's in the process of being restored and having his sins made white as snow. And so let's go turn back to uh, Acts chapter 9. And we want to uh, begin uh, about verse 4. Well, let's go back up to verse 3. Of course, he's got letters from the, the chief priest. He's going to Damascus. He's going to bring chief, uh, Christians back to uh, Jerusalem in chains to throw them in jail because of their their belief in Jesus, they're following this way. All right, so beginning in verse 3, and he journeyed, or, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou, or why are you persecuting me? I'm st still quoting from the King James. Sorry, I'm reading from the New King James. Saul, so why, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you uh, to kick against the goads. So he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Rise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul rose from the ground uh, and when his eyes were opened, he saw, no, uh, he saw no one, so he was blinded. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now, during this three-day period, if there was any person that was more convinced that 
Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was the Son of God, that what he had been doing in his former life as a Pharisee, as a Hebrew, as a persecutor of Christians was wrong, it was Saul. He was convinced now that Jesus uh, was the way. He was convinced because he was willing, you know, Jesus told him, you know, arise, go to Damascus, and it'll be told you what you should do. He was a believer. Now, many in the denominational world today say, all you have to do to be saved is what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Invite him into your heart. Say a sinner's prayer. Now, we know that the sinner prayer doesn't work. Number one, let's look at uh, what Paul was doing uh, during these three days. Uh, let's see. Let's go over to Acts chapter 22, where Ananias comes uh, to Saul. So Paul, Saul has been led into Damascus. He's in a house by... Uh, owned by, a, I believe it was Judas, uh, an individual by the name of Judas. And, of course, God appears to Ananias, a faithful Christian in the city of Damascus, and said, okay, Ananias, got a job for you. You're going to go over to the street called Straight, and you're going to find one by the, a man by the name of Saul, and you're going to tell him what he must do to be saved. Of course, we know Ananias' response, don't we? Was he eager to, to make that door knock? I can't imagine I would have been too gung ho about the thing either. Because let's face it, why was Saul in Damascus? In Damascus to begin with. He was looking for Christians. He had a paper. He had a paper that gave him authority to bring them back to Jerusalem for imprisonment and probable death, if not torture and, and beatings and so on. So he had, so he, you know, and people knew this. And so, obviously, Ananias was a little less than ready. But, of course, God said, you go to him, you know, I'm going to show him what he's going to suffer for my cause. Uh, and so, for this period of time, and Ananias, of course, gets up and goes. Uh, and then, uh, verse, uh, let's go down to verse 13. Well, it's, we'll read 12. Then one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, now not brother because he was a Christian, but brother because he was a Jew. All right, he was of the Jewish nation. Remember the gospel went to the Jews first. All right, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at the same hour, I looked up at him. And in other words, his eyesight came back. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice uh, of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so we see that for three days, Saul was in prayer. We turn over to Acts chapter 26, and we see that that's what he was doing. He fasted, he neither ate nor drank, and he was in prayer. Now, if there was ever a sinner's prayer that should have or could have worked, it should have been this one. Saul saw the Lord himself on the road to Damascus. He, was, he talked with him, had a conversation, and he believed now that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, and then spent three days praying for the answer. He knew he wasn't right yet. And Ananias, obviously, when he came to Saul, what, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So if there was ever an example of a sinner prayer, sinner's prayer not working, right here it is. It didn't work for Saul. Will it work for anyone in the world today? Well, see on TV, you know, one of the, the uh, Franklin Graham, I believe, took over from his father. Pray this prayer with me and invite Jesus into your heart and that's all. You know, give us a call and let us know that you're saved. Well, that's not going to save anybody. It didn't save Saul. It's not going to save anyone today. All right? Because Saul was told, and it's interesting, by the foolishness of preaching. You know, Paul said later on, 
uh, in the book of First. Uh, I think it's I've got it here. Uh, yeah, First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-one. You know that by the foolishness of preaching, not by drama presentations, not by skits, not by things like that. The gospel is to be presented by the foolishness of preaching, and that's what Ananias was told to do to Saul. You go to him and you tell him what he needs to do. You preach to him what he has to do to be uh, pleasing to me. And, of course, that's exactly what Ananias did. He preached to Saul, and wasn't much of a sermon, but once Saul what he needed to do, of course he did it. Uh, his sight was restored. And so for that three days, Saul believed but was lost. Saul believed, but he was still a sinner. And he still had the sins uh, that he had carried up through this point of his life, you know, 30, 31 years, whatever, 28 years, something like that. He had the sins that, uh, that you know, Jesus said, you know, why are you persecuting me? You know, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. It's hard for you to, to make headway against something that, uh, that is, uh, you know, is the, is the truth. And so for the next then approximately, let's say if, Saul li if Paul lived to be 60, uh, about 28, so 30, 32 years, we know that Ananias's message that God gave to Ananias in the vision that Saul's going to have to suffer a lot for the cause of Christ because we see that that's exactly what happened. When was Saul saved? All right, there are three possibilities. Number one, on the road to Damascus, when he saw the Lord and believed. Okay, you know, that, you know there's, there's one possibility. Okay, if he was saved there, Ananias wouldn't have had to tell him, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. They should have already been gone. You know, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, pray this prayer and your sins will be forgiven. You know, Saul still had his sins. So he was not saved on the road to Damascus. Was he saved while he was praying for three days, not eating and drinking? For three days he prayed for the answer uh, to his, we don't know what his prayer was, but obviously uh, I can imagine, you know, Lord, send me the answer. Help me understand what your will is so that I can do it in my life. And, uh, of course, uh, in Acts uh, twenty-two sixteen. 16, when Ananias told him, why are you waiting? What are you waiting for, Saul? Uh, arise and be baptized. Your sins will be washed away when you do that. Just as our sins are washed away today when we contact the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism. Now, it's not the water because the water just comes out of the fountain. And it's the same water that you get a drink out of the water fountain. It just comes out of the faucet. It's not the water itself. Uh, that washes away the sins. It's the symbolic uh, contacting of the blood of Christ in baptism. And so that was what washed the sins, Saul's sins away, and certainly what will do the same thing for us, will restore us. Then let's follow up uh, the third part of Saul's life. So the first part, his sinful life, his, uh, then his conversion for three days, the, uh, the sinful believer... Uh, because he was still in his sins, and then Saul's new life. As we see then in uh, chapter uh, 23, uh, verses 1 and 2, uh, Paul said about his former life, Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, and said, Men and brethren, I lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest uh, commanded those that stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Uh, and Paul said to him, God will strike you and, and you whitewashed wall, for you sit, in, uh, sit and you sit to judge me according to the law and do command me to be struck contrary to the law. So Saul has, has said, folks, what I was doing while I persecuted Christians, I did in good conscience. I did it thinking I was being pleasing to God, but I was not. And of course, uh, as Jesus called the, the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, whited sepulchers, Paul basically says the same thing to the high priest. I mean, you know, and I can imagine this is a matter of a few weeks or months. You know, they remembered who Saul was. They remembered who he was in the, San, or in the, uh, in the sect of the Pharisees and in the, uh, you know, all of this. 
And when he smelt, you know, smart mouthed, as far as the high priest goes, you know, he told the one, you slap him in the face. All right? And of course, um, you know, Saul said, well, you know, do what you've got to do, but, you know, you're still a bunch of hypocrites and not uh, following the law of God. So we see that uh, Saul went about, beginning in verse uh, 9, of, or, or 21 of verse 9, to preach the gospel. Of course, we know that early the Christians, uh, I don't know that you would invite Saul into the auditorium or into the church to preach to you if he had come to Damascus to drag a bunch of you off to prison uh, to be killed and tortured. I can't imagine that you'd say, okay, yeah, let's let him come in and preach as a gospel sermon. All right? Uh, so, of course, we know Barnabas went with Saul and said, nope, things are good. He's you know, he's, he's, he's been converted. He is now one of us. He's a Christian. He's a brother in Christ. And aided that transition for, uh, for Saul. Of course, he was rejected now by the Jews. Again, he was feared by Christians, and rightfully so. Uh, and it, I'm sure it took a, a fair amount of time. Can you imagine being preached to by somebody who may have been responsible for your mother or father being drug off to prison and beaten and killed and then being preached about how to live a good Christian life by a man who, you know, had the letter and, and arrest that man. He's a Christian. Let's get him out of here. Take him to prison. And you, now, a few months later, Saul is preaching to them about Jesus, about uh, what he, uh, I'm sure, about his conversion to Christianity uh, and I can imagine that would have been quite, a, uh, quite an eventful sermon uh, uh, when Saul first started preaching. So for the next 30, 32 years, whatever, we know that Saul conducted at least three missionary journeys, uh, 27 books in the New Testament. How many of them did Paul write? 17, 14? What? Bob, do you remember the number? 13 or 14, okay. I, uh, Hebrews that we're not sure about. There's you know, flip a flip coin, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so at least 13 for sure. And probably no more influential Christian uh, at spreading the gospel, at spreading the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, his missionary journeys, we know that he, uh, he was on at least three, possibly four. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians. Paul makes a list of the things that, uh, that uh, he had done. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll read uh, five or six verses, because Saul himself, or Paul himself, excuse me, Paul himself here describes the things that in this part, up to this point in his uh, Christian life, he has had to endure. Beginning in verse uh, 22, um, are they, uh, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequently. In deaths often. Of course, he was killed and left for dead. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Remember, that's 39 stripes and in many cases... The, the victim didn't survive one 39-strike beating. Uh, he was beat five times. Now, I can't do the math in the top of my head, but that's a lot of times being beaten. Uh, verse 25, three times I was beaten with rods. Uh, once I was stoned and left for dead, of course. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other thing, what come upon me daily, my deep concern uh, for all the churches." And so here we see the things up to this point that Saul had had to go through for the cause of Christ. Now, if in 15 minutes, thank you, he, he had trouble doing, the, doing this. <laughs> he wrote it on a piece of paper. That's very ingenious. ingenious. All right. Uh, so up to this point in first, or 2 Corinthians, uh, we know that from this point on, 
there was still more of Saul's life to occur. Uh, if the book of 2 Corinthians was written about 57 A.D., uh, and Paul had already suffered this many things that we see there uh, from verse 23 to 28, if he had already went through this, uh, then there were going to be approximately, again, if he lived to be 60 or 61, there would have been at least 11 more years. During this 11 years, uh, here are some of the other things that we know Paul did after the writing uh, at the time in 2 Corinthians. He went on a, uh, finished his third missionary journey and possibly did a fourth. And again, there's some speculation, and, and uh, I personally believe that there was a fourth missionary journey. Uh, Paul was arrested and how he was treated, mistreated in Jerusalem uh, again. Uh, he was imprisoned, two, imprisoned uh, in Jerusalem for two years. Uh, he had the perilous journey from Caesarea to Rome that included another snake bite and, or another, excuse me, another shipwreck and a snake bite. And of course, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the individuals on the island thought, well, this guy's dead. And, and of course, he just shook the snake off and, and uh, did not suffer any ill effect. Uh, Paul's uh, first Roman imprisonment in Caesarea. Then Paul was under house arrest and imprisoned in Rome. Uh, there was a three to four year period that between his first and his second imprisonment, and it's during this time that, again, the speculation of the possibility of, uh, of a fourth missionary journey. And then, of course, his final imprisonment in Rome uh, as he appealed to Caesar, as being a, uh, a Roman citizen, he appealed to Caesar and uh, was then uh, you know, held until his execution. Uh, and uh, so we see that Paul had many other things that he was still going to suffer for the cause of Christ, even after he had uh, written the, the words of 2 Corinthians uh, and the letter to the church at Corinth the second time. And so we see that Saul's conversion, as I'm getting a countdown now, wow, it's getting fancy up here, Chris. Uh, uh, I'll pay, I don't pay attention to those either. <laughs> okay. Uh, we see that Saul, certain, well, Paul, again, I, you know, the, the names are interchangeable. He was Saul, uh, and I think what well, was his Roman name and Greek name. Uh, but Paul, of course, as the, uh, the apostle of Christ, as an apostle of Christ, uh, you know, taught so many people. So much of the world, so much of the New Testament came because of the, uh, the zeal that now Saul had for the cause of Christ. So he had three parts to his life. He had his former life in sin. He was a religious individual. I'm talking religious individual. This man was religious. No one can deny that Paul had a religious conviction, maybe more so than anyone I know of in the Bible. You know, we know Cornelius, the first Gentile conversion, was a good man did all these good things, gave alms and prayed daily and all these good things, you know, much of the world did it, much religious world today, they'd say, well, yeah, he's Christian, he's saved just because of the good things that he does. Saul was not only, you know, he was a religiously uh, devout individual, a zealot, and yet he was still lost. So his sincerity got him nowhere, you know, Many of our family, many of our friends, many of the people that we try to teach the gospel of Christ to, well, I believe in Jesus, and I'm sincere. I'm a good person. I'm going to be all right. No, you're not. Saul wasn't all right. Why would the Lord make an exception for someone today if he wouldn't make an exception for Saul? Saul needed the waters of baptism. Uh, he was in his sin, even though he was a believer. And so today, we see our, you know, if you look back, if you're a Christian, if you're a New Testament Christian, you can look back on your life and that period of time before you became a Christian. And, you know, many of us, I was carried to church by mom and dad. You know, nowadays they wait eight or ten weeks to bring babies to church you know, I think I was probably the very next Sunday that mom was able to get out and go. 
Uh, we were at, you know, at services, and, and that's all I can remember as far as religion goes. I've always been, you know, in the Lord's church. I've always attended and at gospel meetings, and we had the preachers and, you know, uh, fed preachers and, and people staying with us. And, you know, but that period of time, you know, in my life, that didn't make me a Christian. Just because mom and dad were living a Christian life, that doesn't make me a Christian. That didn't, you know, that wasn't, uh, that, you know. Of course, when I got to college and I started studying evolution and I started studying science, I came to a point where I've got to make a decision here. Am I going to accept the evolutionary teachings of modern science or am I going to make the faith that I saw in my grandfather and grandmother on my dad's side, uh, on his, you know, the, my namesake, David Everson, who was an elder in the Lord's church. You know, am I going to make that my faith? And I can't do it because of their faith. I've got to do it because it's what I know God expects me to do. And so we all enter that phase. We have a period of time when we come to the realization that we're lost. Okay? And once we learn what is necessary, just as Saul did on the road to Damascus. And while he was in Damascus and Ananias came to him and preached the gospel to him, then he knew what he needed to do. After he was told, arise and be baptized, he went and did it. And so that period of time when, you know, Mike Phillips, our minister, calls it the white knuckle syndrome. Whenever you stand at the you know, for the, the invitation song and you hold on to the back seat so hard because you don't, you, well, you know you need to respond, but you don't want to respond and your knuckles turn white because, you know, you just don't have the courage to step out and, and uh, you know, render obedience. Not that that's the only time it can be done because I can guarantee that the, the preachers and the elder, if it's in the middle of the night that you know you need uh, the waters of baptism to have your sins washed away, those doors will be opened and the baptism will occur at whatever hour of the day or night, no matter how many people witness it, it can be one or two or uh, whatever, and, but it will be done. And so we certainly, and it's interesting, in England, they don't offer an invitation. I have preached uh, bunches of sermons in England the church, for the churches over there. They never extend an invitation. They never sing an invitation song. It's at whatever point you know you need the, the, the watery grave of baptism that you need to respond, you do it right then. If it's the middle of the sermon, the preacher will stop. He'll quit what he's doing. If it's the middle of the Bible class, they stop. They do the baptism right then and there. They don't, they don't uh, have an invitation. That was a little weird for me having preached and, and always uh, extending an invitation, had an invitation song. But, of course, that's just a tradition, not a, a scriptural teaching. And so as we look at our lives, as we look at the time before, as we are all sinners, as we all have sin, as we all are in sin, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, when we come to the realization that we're going to be lost if we stay that way, that we have no hope of eternity. As we'll study tomorrow night, the resurrection from the dead, it's not going to be fun if we did not die in the Lord. And so then after the, when you reach the realization, you find out through the foolishness of preaching that you're lost and you need to be uh, converted and have your sins washed away, be made white as snow. You're perfect at that point. And the song uh, Lord, I would be perfectly whole. When, we're, when we come up out of the waters of baptism, we're a newborn babe in Christ. Jesus taught Nicodemus, you know, had to go through the water and, and be born again. Nicodemus didn't understand that uh, about the baptism, about the immersion uh, for the remission of sins. And so then from that point on, then the need to stand up for Christ to follow him, to walk as his, in his commandments, to love him, to be obedient to him. And as Paul did, may have to go through trials and temptations. You know, we're fortunate we live in America. That doesn't mean we don't have some challenges to our Christianity. A lot of times it comes from our, 
our baseball games or our, our camping gear or our, you know, our TVs. Oh, there's a good football game on uh, Sunday night. I, I'm going to stay home and watch it. Well, you know, we're, those, are, those are the challenges we have to put behind us. In many places in the world today, Christians, uh, of course, are dealing with much more serious issues. I was preaching one night in the, uh, for the congregation in Bristol, England. Uh, they don't have air conditioning over there. It's interesting. They very seldom have that many hot days. But I was standing in the middle of the auditorium, not near this big, and I was preaching. The doors were open in the back, and they had two men sitting on either side of the door. And they told me after the fact that we have to do that because there are people, generally young people, that will come in and try to disrupt services. They will try to stop them from preaching the gospel. So I'm doing my Christian evidence and stuff and see this young man come up the steps. And he wasn't, like I said, he didn't look like he was coming to church, let's put it that way. And just as soon as they, the men saw him, they stood up and he turned around and made a quick exit. So I don't know what his plans were for, uh, for trying to stop the, uh, the lesson at that point. But certainly today, if persecutions come to us in America as Christians, we must endure it. We must be faithful. We cannot blaspheme as Saul tried to get the Christians to do, to deny that Jesus was the Christ. And, of course, there are people today that will want us to do that as well. Tomorrow night, we'll look at the uh, resurrection of Jesus. You can read John chapter 14, the entire chapter, uh, and there will be some additional areas uh, that we'll go to. Uh, thank you for your attention this evening, and I think I missed it by 10 seconds. I got